So my understanding, Matt, is that uh, you were at the Iowa State Fair recently, and I actually wrote a piece about that for Jacobin. What was your experience there? So in August, we went to the first week of the Iowa State Fair, the first weekend, because they have. we wanted to experience it. We also have a long-term project that I can't go into yet. Hopefully Ooh, secrets. We got a secret thing going on. Big things coming, y'all. Uh, and we were there because they have a thing, the first weekend especially, called the uh, the Des Moines Register soap, political soapbox, and it's a little area right when you come in one of the entrances, and it's a little raised platform where the Des Moines Register has set up, and then there's a little audience area, and there's a tent for uh, press afterwards, and every declared candidate is invited to come up, and they get, I think, something like 15 minutes to give a little stump speech and then get talked. Then they talk to the media and then they wander around and get their picture taken, deep throating corn dogs, <laughs> eating the giant turkey leg, whatever they want to do. Real populist. Yeah, exactly. People expect yeah. to see from politicians. Uh, the, the real key to that, I'm sure they tell everyone, if you're going to eat the corn dog, keep your eyes open the whole time. <laughs> you do not want a photograph of you eating the corn dog with your eyes, eyes, up, eyes closed. Indeed, indeed you do not. Not at all. And I, that, I'm just picturing Andrew Yang right now for well, some reason. Well, Yang, we saw, we saw, we didn't see Yang's speech. We got there right after Yang was done, and we saw Yang wandering the thoroughfare, uh -huh. and he got a giant renaissance turkey leg okay so that kind of showed me oh outside the box thinking <laughs> very interesting it's, i could it's, see it's, him at a, at a fucking fair actually at a renaissance fair I could absolutely see that. he um, was actually like a goth kid wasn't he Just yes i saw the yeah, goth yeah. pictures pretty impressive so him uh, and ben shapiro but yeah. anyway so <laughs> so Iowa state fair soapbox yeah and so we wanted to see as many as we could and we saw, we saw a good chunk of them we probably saw six or seven people give their little spiels and the thing that really stuck out was how contentless it was and i mean you can't even say that without that being a cliche about how political speech is hollow and it really struck me that like, one of the chief obstacles that bernie's going to face really is just the fact that he has to use the same platforms and the same general rhetorical toolbox as people who have spent the better part of a century making those things meaningless right. and, and honestly ridiculous to most normal people. Uh, and that would really struck home to me watching at the Iowa State Fair when these guys would talk. I mean, these are presidential candidates. I mean, some of them were, you know, losers, low, low status nobodies. Uh, you know, your, your Joe Seastacks, God bless them. I, thought, I, I, I <laughs> actually thought, I thought he was actually incredibly charismatic and I would have loved to see him in one of the debates. I think he would have had a viral moment. But he will be the Secretary of the Navy, perhaps. Perhaps. Even though we don't have those anymore. Uh, and, like, I saw de Blasio, just pathetic. But the crowds were just minuscule, especially considering how large the audiences were potentially. I mean, there's 100,000 people who go to those things on a given day. And at any moment in the park, you probably have 50,000 people in there. And you've got maybe a couple hundred at best. Because it's, what are you, what are you hearing? What's the point well, of it? There's this? this stage managed, choreographed, sort of spectacle, right? Yeah. That people expect from politicians. And right. this is this is tied into the electability thing, right? Who can play this particular role the best? Yeah. Who can say the the most right and popular things to the right people, whether there is content there at all, because ultimately this spectacle becomes like an empty vessel. And I think as you said, Bernie Sanders and his campaign is attempting to actually use that form, right? Use mm -hmm. that format in order to push, you know, what is a class politics. Right. And and that's it's going to be a challenge because the media, honest, obviously is hostile to this, and they have essentially oh, they tried to sus to boycott his campaign in many ways in order to starve it of oxygen, prevent people from hearing the message. His 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 uh, speech that he gave in Queens that we were all at yeah. it was amazing. Twenty six thousand people, thirty pa twenty nine pages, twenty nine page twenty nine of the New York Times the next day, uh, but. Then that is why Trump won in a, in a nutshell. Like beyond anything else, you want to talk about you know, trade deals and, and racism or whatever the fuck else. Like the single, I'd say, real hinge point reason that Trump won is that when he was on TV, he was entertaining. He was so entertaining. People cared. Like yeah. I, I've said this. I remember I read a thing that still just haunts me, a story about a woman in uh, Dayton, Ohio, who was a she was about like th 40 years old. She her entire adult life. She'd been a cashier uh, at a Safeway next to Wright Patterson Air Force Base there in Dayton. She'd never voted in her life because she said, I don't pay attention to politics. It wouldn't make sense for me to vote because I don't know what the issues are. 
which you know, hey, that's a fine, yeah, that's an acceptable, totally reasonable uh, opinion to have. Sure, politics, divorce from one's everyday life, yeah. no sense that anything's going to change. Yeah, but then Trump shows up, and she was just enraptured. And then she not only voted for him, she fucking campaigned for him. She was like a creasing captain, knocking on doors. She went from zero to 60. And the entire reason is because television, which is what her main way of processing media was, and, and politics was like a boring channel on television. Right. Like a, 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 a guy comes on to talk, be it George W. Bush or Barack Obama or anybody, you know what it's going to be. You know it's going to be boring. So you just flip no the channel. No matter what channel is C SPAN on, on exactly, the you flip the channel. Dial. But then Trump comes on, and it's all just amazingly entertaining. He's on, pop, pop, it's pop. So it pops so hard yeah. that all of a sudden, even especially if you haven't been paying any attention, have no framework, even if what he's s- selling is pure moonshine, it, you don't know that. And so, boom, you've got a loyal, a, a, a loyal uh, uh, soldier. So I think, and Bernie on Bernie obviously doesn't have that, and he shouldn't because it only really works in in the bad way. Like yeah. the spectacleization <laughs> of politics only works for demagogues yeah. and frauds. He, he, and filled, crooks. he filled that vessel with vulgarity and uh, dog whistles, yeah. and uh, yeah, we don't need a, We don't need a left politician to do that, folks. Yeah. We don't need it. And and honestly, I, I I don't think it's possible. Really, I don't think you could have an effective. Uh, uh, meaningful left politics that that uses that as a cheat code, as seductive as it might be to imagine that. It's good for um, podcasts and uh, Twitter. Folks, yeah, exactly. But not for a C-SPAN. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, my main takeaway was just he's going to have to break through. And being there on Sunday, I felt like he might be able to because the stuff he was saying, even though it is you know measured political speech, which might have the flavor of something people have seen before. The content really was something that we haven't heard, honestly, for a fucking hundred years from a mainstream politician in this country. Yeah, almost uh, like some Eugene Debs type talk. Yeah, um, no, he, the, the, the way his speech ended, where, he's, where he called on people to care for you know, your neighbor as much as you care for yourself, that's, that is direct reference to, to the most famous Eugene Debs speech. You know, when there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Uh, and that's the only weapon we have against capital is solidarity and numbers. That's right. Uh, and and the hope is is that it people hear that and they are able to to overlook the fact that it's a you know a guy behind a podium talking about it. <laughs> well, this uh, podcast will be on our permanent records. So, folks, if you are listening to this in five to ten years, whether you are under the boiling seas or whether you're living <laughs> in the socialist paradise of uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, you will know that this is how we felt in this particular moment in time. Maybe we were naive. Uh, maybe we were completely right. I guess it remains to be seen. Yeah, we're at a, we're at a crossroads. Communist greetings, friends. This is Sean KB of the Antifada, back with another episode of History is a Weapon. That's right, folks. History is a Weapon, number five, hot off the presses. Of course, I am here with my colleague and friend, Matt Crispin. What's up, man? Hey, man. How you doing? Good to be back. Yeah, it's good to have you back. Um, I have a, a very sad story to tell. It's actually a story about the last time we tried to record this. <laughs> um, we uh, Nobody's to blame. In fact, I, I, I think the technology gods just, they, 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 they smited us. Yeah. Um, the recording was lost, and despite all of our best efforts, it could not be retrieved. So um, it's a little, it's disheartening, of course, but here we are a couple months later, and we're going to do it again. Folks, today we are going to tie in a couple, uh, an element that uh, on a couple of other histories of weapons, we had um, kind of come to almost organically when we're talking about U.S. history, and this is the, um, the looming and the, and the large issue of the built environment in general, but suburbia in particular. If you listen to our episode, I believe it was number two, on why there's no socialist party or labor party in the United States, we kind of came to this idea that suburbia and this kind of promise of the American dream of the house with the white picket fence, the two cars, the dog, everyone knows all about that, um, had a sort of um, uh, an effect of decreasing solidaristic actions on the part of the American people and also kind of obscuring the class contradictions that exist in this country, especially after the Second World War. And then when we talked about the 1970s, of course, 
Uh, we talked about how coming into this post-war era, suburbia completely changed the way that Americans lived and also the ways that Americans voted and also the ways that Americans understood themselves, uh, especially working class Americans who for the first time uh, in U.S. history were living in a moment where the sort of Victorian lifestyle of the 1890s that only the bourgeois and the petty bourgeois were able to live in the United States of America, in a sense, became democratized. Mm -hmm. So this happens, of course, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And as we'll see towards the end of this episode, that entire regime, the entire existence of suburbia as this bucolic and beautiful American dream is in crisis right now. So we'll see how we got there and we will think about some of the ways in which uh, struggle might come out of this very, very interesting time that we live in. So to begin this story, and we could probably begin in a lot of different ways, but let's start with the 19th century in the United States, a largely agrarian uh, yeoman farmer republic. Um, city life uh, at that point in time was, you know, the mi minority for most people in the United States. And cities, certainly as economic development moves forward, and certainly after the Civil War, which unleashes, unleashes the productive forces within the United States, cities start to grow larger and larger and larger in the U.S. And of course, with this growing urbanization and the entry of immigrants and farmers and uh, growing working class into these urban areas, you start to have classic urban issues like overcrowding, poverty, disease, hunger, and you have an increasing class struggle as well. So in the second half of the 19th century, you start to have a kind of revulsion that sets in for a lot of uh, fine society at that time for what's happening in these cities. You have the first efforts at reform. In fact, it's only really that the ruling class of the United States in places like New York City and elsewhere starts to give a shit about the teeming poor and working class in the city. It's only when, you know, outbreaks and epidemics start happening like cholera epidemics which don't care whether you live in a fancy mansion on fifth avenue or whether you're in the teeming slums you know the five points down the lower east side guess what comrade cholera he will get you anyways he will get your ruling class ass so with that we start to see a movement of people who with various means of transportation can for the first time almost in human history live outside of the city but work and play inside of it. Yeah, uh, I mean that's how a lot of Brooklyn's development happened. Yeah. Was was Manhattanites uh, find, wanting some place where they could have green, where they could have greenery, and and uh, the the first this first round of suburbs is often referred to historically as streetcar suburbs because they were reached by tram networks and, and light rail, and it was they were an attempt to recreate on a small scale the the bucolic country estates of the landed gentry that the bourgeois had overthrown <laughs> yeah folks uh check out that documentary down abbey for <laughs> that uh class struggle between an ascendant uh bourgeoisie which makes its money off of capital uh and sometimes land but then the old landed gentry which as matt said lived in these wonderful giant manses uh, where they had many, many servants and were able to live a pr economically productive life, or at least they were able to exploit other people and have economic activity happen on their on their lands, but also you know be surrounded by beauty. And so, in the United States, uh, in, in basically the the uh, Anglo world, so you know the United States, Canada, and Britain, in the late 19th century, you start to have the beginnings of a. Uh, what's called uh, the cult of domesticity or what is called uh, the Victorian ideal, mm -hmm. uh, which is essentially this concept of a male breadwinner, uh, you know, owning a home and having a wife that stays at home with the kids. This was available for a very marginal, marginal percentage of the, of the population in these countries. Vastly you know, outnumbered by people who, you know, the mother and the father went to work uh, or they were literally farmers, you know, living on their own land and working their own land. But this idea of this, um, you know, Victorian house, as we call them, where the entire family could live unproductively on their land, mm -hmm. not have to do any work to survive and have this sort of uh, moral, uh, moral upbringing and have also uh, the kind of security that comes from you know owning one's own land and also having a place where you know the breadwinning husband can go home at the end of the day and uh, have calmness and, and security 
uh, that again was predicated on being able to go off and make good money uh, working somewhere. And in the late 19th century, this kind of ideal was not available to a lot of people. But as economic activity and as capitalist social relations expand, you start to have the kind of democratization of at least that lifestyle, right? Mm-hmm. Not, uh, or at least the, the image of that lifestyle for, for Americans and others. Right. Uh, and, yeah, as we said, it was limited to the people who could afford it, which was, you know, during this period when capitalism really did, uh, uh, advanced capitalism did resemble that, you know, Marxist nightmare of hyper-exploited working class ever, ever more miserated. And the satanic mills yeah. of Dickens. It, there was just no chance for it to be any other way uh, for working people. Uh, and then I honestly, I always, it does seem to me like the the hinge point for class, like uh, for Marxist understanding of history where, where you have like, kind of, I, like a B, I kind of think of it as like a BC and an AD, but in terms of like there's a classical Marxist era where certain assumptions hold and held and were confirmed through developments uh, around the world, and then uh, a breach, a breaking point, at which point they didn't anymore, and th- and the new a new analysis had to kind of come forth of it. And I think of that as the World War One. Yes, thank you. I was going to say. Uh, I thought you were going. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. That uh, like, I agree with because because because. Up until the outbreak of World War One, it really looked like the Marxist analysis and even like the revisionist electoral reformist Marxism yeah, Ber- of like the, the, yeah. yeah, Bernstein and Kautsky was correct. You saw everywhere that as soon as franchise expanded in a country, a working class party emerged that rapidly became one of the most powerful uh, parties in the country by virtue of the fact that it represented such a <laughs> massive number of people. Yeah, uh, and they had. They were they were all they were Marxist led. They had Marxist ideas. They created the internet and uh, the Second International, uh, and and they were. It looked like it was happening. It Especially really did. Especially in Germany, the Absolutely, Social Democratic yeah. Party, the classic classical mm-hmm. Marxist party, up until 1914, as you said, kind of it 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 arose to all these assumptions that people had about this uh, this increased class struggle, and also the concentration of the class uh, in the in a political party, and also in massive trade unions mm-hmm. were inextric- st- inextricably linked uh, to the Social Democratic Party. Yep. So that's pre-1914. <laughs> right. And then World War I starts. Oops. And all of these parties... War credits, had, folks. Not good. Yeah, who had devoted <laughs> Them, who had sworn to to resist uh, imperialism and maintain working class solidarity across national lines, all of them chickened out basically and voted for war credits, voted to support the war on patriotic grounds, and the entire uh, project essentially collapsed. And then uh, all of a sudden, instead of this march towards uh, electoral social uh, Marxism, which looked like it was happening in Europe and even in the United States to an extent. Uh, Instead, Marxism emerges from the least developed country in Europe, uh, and honestly, due to the fact that it was the least developed country, right. yeah. uh, because what World War One really brought into, and especially the aftermath of World War One, really brought into focus was the degree to which an advanced capitalist society, even though it is creating a larger, more organized, more self-aware working class, is while it's doing that also creating cultural. Uh, 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 and economic antibodies yes. against radicalism right. amongst that working class. And I would say one of the chief ones that eventually emerges, especially in the United States where free real estate is the name of the game, becomes suburbanization. Yes. Becomes the process whereby a collaboration between working people who, living in cities, wanted something more uh, you know, bucolic, uh, not uh, partially due to racial animus, certainly, sure. uh, yeah. but also just due to the fact that you know that seemed like a nicer lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, I mean like uh, to Hennessy Coates has a thing where he's he thinks that suburbanization happened because of racism. But I honestly believe that if we'd had a, like if if Reconstruction had been successful and we had like kind of conquered racism at the turn of the 19th century somehow in some alternate world, we'd still have su- suburbs. I think so too. Uh, it they, would not be as racialized, right? It, they would yeah. not it'd be as yeah. It would not be like a, a a geography of racial separateness. But the uh, creation of the com- internal combustion engine <laughs> and, and the single uh, occupancy automobile uh, really did 
become a determining factor in a country this, with the size and wealth of the United States. And in a real sense, it inscribed these racial and class divisions onto the landscape itself. Exactly. And this hundred and something year legacy still lives with us today, you know, as these suburbs are in crisis. I want to actually come back to something that you said, uh, just to remind the listeners out there, you said free real estate. Let's kind of uh, get them back up to speed on that. You know, what, what is it in the American psyche, in the American tradition, the American political imagination, right, that, uh, that leads to this conception of the American dream being a place, right? In a, we can go back to 1862, uh, you know, in the midst of the Civil War, the Homestead Act. Yep. Where Bought yourself a farm. Yeah, that's right. The U.S. government, uh, Lincoln, was giving away free land to everybody. Yep. It's this sort of concept of um, the frontier, right, which lives, again, looms large in the American imagination with the Wild West. But it's this sense of, you know, this rugged individual striving for your piece of America. And oftentimes that means a piece of land. Yes. So, again, this um, (laughs) eventually the problem with uh, dispossessing Native Americans and taking their land is you run out of other people's land. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So there's a, uh, a, a, fa- a guy named Frederick Turner uh, who had a thesis in 1893, which he called the Turner thesis. Very presumptuous of him to call it that. <laughs> but uh, he was basically, he was like the Thucydides of American historiography. He comes out of the gate and gives this great explanation for the reason why the United States has a democratic culture, why it's able to be this republic, why it's able to be successful. And he basically points to this frontier notion, right? Mm -hmm. That people would go out west in order to get land, in order to get stuff, in order to strive and uh, aspire to a better life for themselves and for their family. And is this process of the frontier that uh, turns them into, uh, you know, unique American subjects. And that leads to our political system. Turner's thesis, very, very important in history, but ultimately wrong. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, you, you see the frontier run out with the closing of the Wild West in the 1890s. And uh, he was very, very concerned about this idea of a, a democratic society. I think that the West, you know, this this Wild West period that we saw between the Civil War and maybe 1900 was less about creating democratic subjects than it was about all this free land out there. Uh, the Indians obviously needed to be kicked out. You need to tame the land with railroads and dams and, you know, uh, other means. But what the, what the West, this great, these great open expanses really means is a huge and gigantic pot for capitalists and some workers in the United States, not just to piss in, but also take gold out of, right? Yeah. It is an extractive, uh, an extractive, uh, location in the United States. It creates almost primitive accumulation where tons of people in the U.S. are able to go out and make a fortune off of that and quote-unquote civilize this land. And the imprint of that in American psychology, the imprint of being able to go out and strike it rich in the West, whether it's the Comstock load in Colorado where all of the silver comes out of or way out in California in the West, it's not the same as owning a fucking uh, a ranch, you know, a, a two story ranch in suburbia. Mm-hmm. But there is some sort of connection there, I think, for Americans. Oh, no, it's a, it's a continuation. Like so suburbanization is a, is a continuation of that of that homestead notion. And I feel like Turner was wrong just because he was, you know, a, a, a kind of a, he had his head up his ass. and He was a bourgeois, you know, a comfortable racist or whatever. But I think that if you think of it, if you take his terms of like uh democratize uh, d- democratic subjects and you just turn it over and you look at what that means i mean what he's really saying is that it prevents people from resenting the institutions yes. of government it prevents people who are in a ex- oppressed and exploited position from recognizing their oppression and exploitation because of the 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 held out possibility of self sus- self-sufficiency and and dominion in the form of land in the form yeah. of a a plot of land of one's own. And this ideology only becomes something uh, pervasive in the United States because to, his, to an extent it was true. Yes. Right? We talked about the land as a pressure valve for people, right? Yeah. In these teeming cities, you could go off to the suburbs, but you could also go out west, yeah. right? And you could potentially strike it rich, go on this grand adventure and maybe make something for yourself. And that was a reality. But I agree. Where Turner was wrong was in looking at it as like independent, rough and right. ready democratic actors. 
it was true to the extent that it, it creates this this vast vista for people to imagine a new life and actually go out and try and get it. It, it creates people who are uh, who have who in some conscious respect have internalized the values of of, of the society and uh, are willing to uphold it as opposed to being disillusioned by by the fraud you know of of bourgeois culture because it it does hold out a hope for them that they can realize and and, and yeah. turner even in his lifetime he spoke of how worried he was that you know the frontiers are seeding what, what's going to replace it and there was the the initial moment of uh, of imperial uh expansion spanish that we had american with, war, with yeah. the spanish american war and everything but that was tempered by the racial anxiety that prevented us from really embracing that role because we don't want to rule over filipinos yeah, no, I mean, that oh was, my god that bring all those brown terrifying. people into the no. us republic no way so what we what ended up being the continuation of the of the uh, of the frontier was even though the the frontier was technically settled it was not developed or improved and the real last frontier within america is that with the post-war uh lucre of america as the sole uh you know world power and the sole industrial uh, uh power left after world war ii was to take this massive expanse of land that was largely divided now into private hands uh but was still not accessible right. you had you know transit like the trans uh continental railroad and things but you still did not have anything like a reliable system of, of highways or anything to get anywhere. And after World War II, the interstate highway system inter, uh, 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 gave the possibility to turn land that had previously been part of like farms and homesteads and stuff into homes, into unproductive land right. that would nonetheless be a store of value in the form of a you know, 30-year mortgage that you could that, and, and that you could you know, sell when you were, uh, your kids could sell after you die or whatever, a, a, a asset. Right. So to turn you, if not a, into a capitalist, into someone with a, a capital interest, uh, even though you might have been a factory worker or something, you now were actually living part of the bourgeois dream of, of having uh, uh, actual land that is productive in the, in, the, in the capital sense, even if you're not growing anything on it. Uh, it, it it its value uh, only goes up over time. So, in a sense, our revisionist Turner thesis, okay, about the Wild West and this kind of democratic subject, we're, we're revising that to say that it did create a kind of subject, and that is a bourgeois subject, yeah, a monad, a monadic, isolated, individual, striving American subject that sees opportunity and also sees itself in land mm -hmm. sees itself in a asset that it can not only hold in real estate but of course also see appreciate over the generations right this becomes as you said a way that normal everyday people you know if we're talking the early 20th century you're talking about lawyers mm -hmm. doctors um you know maybe uh, uh military like high high ranking members of the military or civil bureaucracy in the united states are able to Let's say commute to uh, I don't know. Let's let's say Philadelphia, mm -hmm. okay, uh, to their uh, the white shoe law firm. But they're able to live out on the main line, out to the northwest of Philadelphia, and they're able to do that because, as you said, transportation. These original streetcar suburbs, and I'm pretty sure that like a good amount of the people listening to this live in an American suburb. It's probably, probably. fair to say. Uh, you'll know the uh, original streetcar suburbs because. They're almost like a, a small little city. They are clustered. The, the shops and the city yeah. hall and the library are all clustered around a park and a railroad station in the center of town. And it's relatively dense and it's walkable. Uh, they tend to be really, really expensive nowadays because those are all things that people decided in the U.S. they want again, right? Yeah, yeah. After, <laughs> after deciding they did. After suburbanism went out to, you know, went to beyond because the first wave you had the, the, the streetcar suburbs. The second wave, post-war wave, you know, the Levittown's farther out, and then you get the edge cities even farther past that, uh, and where you're in, you, you have these, uh, like, absolutely sterile subdivisions of identical uh, mansions or, or fake townhouses around, like, big box real, realtors or, uh, you know... Uh, uh, retailers. Retailers, yeah. yeah. You know, like a fucking uh, Sam's Club or something. Uh, and people are like... 
and you have to drive to get anything. Right. And uh, people eventually realize this kind of sucks. Uh, and so now the walkability is once again prized by, uh, if not the bourgeois, uh, then people who have absorbed those those values. Yes, uh, but the, the uh, professional manager. Yes, class, the perhaps. much spoken of <laughs> professional manager. We'll get there, folks. Don't worry. But uh, the, but so what you had then is the creation of a group of people who were, by any definition of that you would use that included things like relationship to capital, which is its traditional you know, rubric, working class, mm-hmm. living like Victorian middle class people. Like the, or I'm sorry, like uh, Victorian bourgeois, like Victoria, uh, like like those people who created, who lived in the the streetcar suburbs, and so that is where you create, you get this new idea of the middle class, right? And that was one of the great ideological cultural product pro, uh, projects that went along with suburbanization. There's no meant, class struggle if you're in the middle, exactly, because <laughs> the working class that implies an antagonistic relationship. Right. Uh, middle class is just positional; it's just right. where you are. It has it, there's no inherent tension. Uh, and, and the thing is, in that moment after World War II, it was it, it did describe something because you had a phenomenon on something that I don't think Marx could have predicted uh, where uh, you had working class people living like bourgeois people. Right. Like right next door. People who were by any definition bourgeois living across the street in the same development with the same picket fence and the same nice yard. And the same split level house from somebody who worked in a factory or something like that. And so you are describing a new phenomenon whereby people who have a relationship to capital that makes them workers, but have a lifestyle that puts them in the same social milieu as the bourgeois. They can both be in the Alks Club. Yes, right? exactly. So like a union construction worker like myself, for example, in the 1950s or 1960s, making a decent buck. Yeah, it could be living in the same neighborhood as like a, a fancy lawyer or even the, a, a small shop owner, right? Who yeah. maybe owns like three or four stores somewhere uh, out in Mineola. Um, that, again, is a income bracket mm-hmm. and it is a culture and a lifestyle. But of course, we don't. As you know, theorists here, we do not want to actually understand the world simply in those terms. Again, it's based on your relationships to the means of production. There's something, I mean, I don't want to go too fucking galaxy brain here, but the same middle class that we're talking about, the same petty bourgeois, right? Uh, and, and even the, the bourgeoisie uh, in this earlier period, they, um, they hated the city. Yeah. They were progressives, like with a big P at that point in time. They saw all of the issues or many of the issues that existed within the city, the cholera, the overteaming, the crowding and the poverty itself as an outgrowth of the city. The city being too compact, the city being too dirty, not having a good enough sanitation, not having good enough libraries, not having good enough schools and parks. In a sense, this bourgeois mind um, thought that it could order the cities by making them more green and by passing legislation and creating social work and all other sorts of means in order to go down to these lowly masses and teach them how to live or to make sure that houses were built in a certain way and up to code. So there was a strong anti-urban bias. And what I think is interesting about that is that when you look at the modern suburb that arrives in the 50s and 60s, it is in a sense an anti-city. You mentioned, Matt, that people, you know, you, there's this big box store up the street in a strip mall that you have to drive through. In some suburbs, there's no fucking sidewalks yeah. anywhere. <laughs> you know, you're walking in the middle of a fucking street, almost going to get killed by traffic. And why is that? I mean, probably for a lot of reasons, but I think very interestingly, the folks who design these suburbs, William Levitt, for example, who you mentioned, who, by the way, also said, and this is important because this was in the McCarthyist period, he said, a man who owns, owns a home cannot be a communist. He has yes. too much to do. Yep. <laughs> so he, he understood something about this class contradiction that exists with, with home ownership, right? Uh, but when the Levitts of the world come together and they create these giant uh, developments filled with ticky-tacky 
uh, cookie cutter homes that are built in this assembly line process by teams of workers who come into you know either an old farm that they bought out or to a beautiful forest. When you see a development somewhere called River Run, that's because a river used to run through <laughs> it, not that concrete pond you see there. And when it's called like Deer Park, it's because deer used to actually live there, yeah. and now it's all it's all bulldozed over. But they have a statue of a deer <laughs> next to the fucking tire store, right? <laughs> Which is very charming, actually. Yeah. I think we're talking about the same deer statue. <laughs> I do love it. Uh, yeah, but like um, these developers had the same mentality that these bourgeois reformers of the late 19th and early 20th century had of anti-urbanism. If we're going to create these developments, essentially create entire towns out of nowhere, out of the ground, and sink all this money into it and then get people to come to it, it has to be an anti-city. Commerce and industry need to be completely separated from the residential areas. Where the city is densely packed each house is going to have its own yard mm -hmm. where the city you take buses and you walk around or whatever only the personal automobile you know will be the means of transportation for this particular place so it's almost like a bourgeois bias built into these places themselves of this these individuated families living you know in nuclear fashion inside these small houses part of a community but also separated from a community um Owning their homes, but also, in a sense, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, and being competitive with the people around them and making sure that the dirty parts of life like commerce or making stuff are kept far, far away. As long as, you know, especially in these bedroom communities, people can leave and go to work in the morning, come back in the afternoon and have like a, a relatively safe and, uh, you know, nice town to live in. Yeah. Uh, and it does speak to, I think, because. Nobody forced anybody into these things, you know? No. There was no, there was no sort of Pol Pot empty the city's move. No, no Red Guard marched in and forced all those <laughs> workers out of their tenements yeah. to go to the, to go to the, uh, the suburbs. Uh, it was an appealing option, and, and that is something that uh, has to always be reckoned with, like the degree to which capital's willingness to sort of uh, put out a... a, 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 a a, a seductive uh, thing, like some some sort of some sort of uh, a carrot uh, to 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 militate against uh, uh, militancy, uh, and I feel like with this one, with with the with the move to the suburbs, uh, I can see the appeal. I can see, as certainly if you factored racism, also. Uh, but I honestly wonder if anyone would have signed on if they'd known what it would have done. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the – and I don't think – and I think this is the sort of the ingenuity of capitalism really as a, as a, as a cultural force and as a, as a shaper of environments is that its logic isn't even necessarily anything that anyone knows they're doing at the time. Mm. Like Levitt was saying that, you know, and, but, but the, the workers were, were demanding – I mean, the specific, like the specific context of, of, of the post-war suburbs yeah. is not just – people wanting land it was a housing crisis yes a sure. massive housing crisis that occurred Coming out of the world war out of, after world war ii people were living in chip, chicken coops yeah i mean uh and but the thing is there's different ways to deal with it for example in the uk they dealt with it by an unprecedented uh public housing yep. uh building the council estates, the council estates yep. which to this day house a, a huge percentage of the british population uh which means that to, if you're an American for whom public housing is inherently a stigmatized thing, as it became, uh, yeah, uh, to to like to see the, the the vast number of people and the different you know uh, 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 pe people in almost every like scale of, of of income and stuff who live in public what is technically public housing, you just you don't even you can't even get your head around it. Yeah, uh, but we chose another thing. We chose uh, to build these suburbs, and the function the functional reason. Because we both, because the U.S. came out of World War II with the same like center-left majority, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, it, it wasn't a workers' party like the Labor Party was, but it was still a party that was the backbone of its electoral support came from the working class, as the Labor Party in Britain. But the difference, that free real estate, baby, free real estate, it's folks. that free real estate. Oh man, because like you're in the U.K., you're in this tiny, packed little fucking island. Oh, you got a car. Good. What are you going to do with it? I mean, they, they suburbanized, but nothing on our scale right. because they didn't have the land. And we to, had the ability to do that. We did. And, and it was part of our tradition. Yes. Right? <laughs> it was our go-to at, at that moment and others. And I think what's, what's interesting, too, is that like 
we did have public housing, but I'm sure if you looked at the numbers, I don't have them in front of me. The amount of like the of the U.S. surplus that went into building like the NYCHA projects and other public housing in the United States would be so dwarfed by this entire industry and economy that arises of new housing. Yep. You know, all of, of it under under all of it underwritten with federal money, yes, federal loan guarantees. Very important to understand is that. People look at public housing and say, like, oh, that's government housing. You know, these poors are getting, you know, they're living off the company dime or uh, sorry, the government dime. What are the fucking suburbs? Yes. Matt mentioned the interstate highway. system. Yes. That would be the equivalent of billions upon billions yes. of dollars right now. And it fundamentally reshapes not just the face of the United States, but of course, the ways that people get around and the opportunities you have to do things in other places like build giant fucking tract housing, you know, maybe 50 miles from the city center. And of course, too, while these public housing projects are being built out of this housing crisis you're talking about uh, in the in the late 40s and into the 50s, you also have things like you know, the GI Bill and the mm -hmm. Federal Housing Administration and massive uh, lending subsidies that are given to Americans, especially you know white veterans of that Second World War. It isn't just the built environment that's subsidized, but it's also directly saying to working class people, if you leave this city, especially white working class people, if you leave the city and go out to the suburbs, you'll get a house for, you know, seven hundred dollars down. It's going to end up costing you four thousand dollars in that day's money. And uh, your mortgage is going to be incredibly cheap and you'll be able to it'll be cheaper than an apartment would be yeah. in, in the main city. So all sorts of subsidies to the social reproduction of the working class come out from the federal government and from the states and from the municipalities in this kind of semi-social democratic moment at that time. But again, like the what uh, the results of this, of this sort of um, grand project of a strong federal government are not for greater social solidarity. They, in fact, are for the re isolation isolating of the working class, which had been in these teeming cities, which also had really strong labor movements and had working class neighborhoods where people had roots in them, where the union hall was right up the street from where everybody lived and worked, where people knew one another and had created socialist parties and uh, reading clubs and trade unions and other sort of working class institutions in those cities. It turns out when those folks are separated and dispersed into the suburban areas with this government subsidy and because capital can make a lot of money off of it, a lot of those solidarities that help to create this new deal, help to create the prosperity that comes after the Second World War, the social roots for that are uprooted and destroyed and, by these same suburbs. And that's how you get that's how you get the transition from from working class to middle class. Not just the living in a in the style of the old bourgeois, but as we said, by any meaningful objective measure, those houses, those suburbs, were public housing in right. the sense that they could not existed, could not existed in any, could not have been viable for a moment except without, for the illusion you have that you made made it yourself. Exactly, right? and that's what's the difference. <laughs> yeah, that's the difference between the middle class and the working class. It's a fully you're a working separation. class. Yes, you're a worker, but you you live in a house that. You think, and that this culture tells you, it's your house. But by any stretch is the product of, yeah, the last gasp of the New Deal, the last gasp of social democracy. But it's been siloed off in an individual home uh, where all of the government uh, 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 funding, the government subsidy is hidden from you. Right. Uh, up to this day, with like everybody, every motherfucker who takes a mortgage uh, interest deduction on their taxes is getting a fucking government subsidy <laughs> yeah. to be a homeowner. That's right. And it's completely sub submerged. As as we schmucks rent, right? Yeah, and uh, it's even it's even stronger than that too, because as I said, the this post war boom of oil and rubber and steel and housing and everything, you know, this massive economy along with the manufacturing, right? You have like this this massive publicly public subsidy put into this suburbia, but you have private developers who are making the fucking profit off yes. of it too. So it's a subsidy that goes through capital in order to give working class white Americans this sense, you know, a real better life out there, you know, with an actual lawn and, you know, good schools or whatever, right? But gives them also the sense that like this was they were bootstrapped it. Yeah. That they made it them so they homesteaded it yeah. essentially, right? And then they then they take that uh, that concept of them as a new as a new homesteader uh, with with, the, with all of the 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 social underpinnings totally submerged from their from their site, uh, and then they create a new lifestyle of of the nuclear family of 
car uh, transportation uh, of of atomization away from their fellow workers. Uh, and over time, surprise, surprise, it leads to a reactionary turn oh, yeah. uh, among the the white suburban middle class or and, working class and who let's, become middle class. Right. Qu- we're always whenever we use middle class during right. this podcast, during this episode, yeah. just imagine the, the, the hand quotes, the yeah. air quotes that are going on. And just there. parenthetically, like that is one of the one one of the huge reasons that Bernie Sanders is genuinely a different animal and someone worth supporting. Just watch one of these motherfucking debates, and you'll watch 19 people you say middle class 500 times, <laughs> and there's one guy up there who will say working class, and, and also, it's Bernie Sanders. And also the only one up there who won't do the weird thumb pointy <laughs> thing will actually do air quotes, sarcastic air quotes, yes. and while he's yelling at people. And point a finger. And point, and point a finger. Because, it's so refreshing. Because <laughs> the, 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 th- the thing he's talking about, the thing Sean's talking about, is the thing where you curl your finger around. And that was pioneered by... Uh, Bill Clinton, oh, and was it, it? it was, and it was. He was told by somebody that you can't point because it's too accusatory. Right. You need to be. You can't be that confrontational. God it's, forbid it's, a po- it's, politician get confrontational. Yeah. Or no. 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 Well, not a DLC uh, homeboy <laughs> like Bill Clinton. He's trying to. I thought you were going to say. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Neil Kinnock invented it, but basically the same person. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm trying to. Yeah. I'm trying to like soothe soothe my way in there. I'm not trying to conf- like use conflict to get in there. Right. No. Uh, so so someone told him. Don't point. You got, and so he said, well, what if I bring the finger around? <laughs> and then you got Bernie up there. The only guy who will point a goddamn finger. No, I love it so much. It's yeah. good. His, his hate is pure, folks. Absolutely. It's amazing. You'll love it.